Thank, thank you very much, everyone. Um, if you like my talk, try to clap enthusiastically at the end. I'll be okay with that. All right, so, yeah, thank you very much. So, first of all, I'm, you know, this is a 45-minute talk crammed into 30 minutes and reduced to 20. So, let's see how we can do here. Um, workflow and chat ops. Quick raise of hands. Who has used or heard of chat ops? Okay, keep your hand up if you ha are using chat ops. Eh, okay, good, okay. And everybody's, kind of, who is familiar with workflow? Hands up if you're familiar with workflow. Anybody using workflow? Okay, all right, okay, a decent amount of people. So who, who am I up here? Oh, that doesn't work. Who am I up here talking about all this stuff? I'm James Fryman. I work at Stackstorm. Um, we did kind of a brief vendor presentation. What I just want to throw out here is all of the things I'm talking about we're working on. So if you're interested in it, come find me afterwards. So what do I do? I do IT ops. This is kind of interesting because IT ops is traditionally looked as a cost center within organizations, right? They are taking money associated with keeping the business running, so we're just going to throw money at it. Well, that's not how I like to do my job. I don't like to be considered a cost center. I like to figure out how I can actually provide business value. And that usually means a couple things for an ops person. That means accelerate your delivery, right? Make it so that folks that, who are delivering business value, get, them, get it out there as fast as you possibly can. But you have to make sure that it's resilient on top of that, right? So basically, in a nutshell, keep all the things on, right? But the problem with this is that this is only as good as your weakest link. And the weakest link in all of these because I'm an ops person, I practice pain-driven development, the weakest link in all of my problems, well, they're humans. Yes, they're humans. Humans are fragile. Horribly, horribly fragile. Turns out, when we're given instructions, we do them wrong. We don't get them right fast enough. We put input in improperly. But frankly, most of the time, it's usually due to a lack of knowledge. And so a problem comes up in your organization, what immediately happens? Well, we're just going to put in this brand new tool to fix it, right? Oh, no, I've got a really good idea for a tool. Why don't we use this one? No, actually, my tool is much better, so let's spend time on that. Well, this is kind of obfuscating the problem of I want to provide delivery, I want to provide acceleration, I want to provide resiliency. These things don't happen today in our world where they're difficult to happen in our world, and in this room is kind of a, a misnomer, but if you go out into the real world, this is hard, because IT ops teams are meat clouds, basically, with people throwing money at them as cost centers. And so when you try to come up and you say process optimization, how to fix problems in my weak link, usually you get into the bike shed and you just kick the can down the road. So what I want to argue, and I want to kind of make an argument for today is, I'm not going to convince you of anything. I'm not going to change your mind about anything. I just want to inspire a little bit of thought so that when you go home after all of this, you remember chat ups and workflow. Cool. So I'm going to talk about three benefits why you should use chat ups and workflow. Uh, the first of which is I say it is a path toward automation. There's been a lot of question marks here today but how do we get to this end state that we want to go to? And it's been a question of my own for many years. How do we get to this place where computers are actually doing the work for us? Where I can actually think about you know, going on a vacation, right? Or something along those lines, right? The truth of the matter is, there will be many roads. We're still trying to figure those out. But chat ops and workflow create an interesting combination, if you will. Because at some point, you have to start to control the human behavior in some way. And when you do that with chat ops, you suddenly are able to create human structures with which they communicate to back-end infrastructure, back-end computing. Likewise, when you have workflows, you can start to abstract the tasks that are being done into smaller atomic pieces and separate the business logic, which is also usually a pretty uh, flimsy piece from your bash scripts and your Ruby scripts and your Python scripts. You move them into an actual workflow engine so you get better testing of your things. But it turns out, anytime you try to actually go do a real automation implementation in a company, it gets rejected. Why is that? Well, the first of which is nobody ever trusts it, right? I don't trust it because it's this black box that sits in a corner and it just does things. You know, I've been in part of automation implementations at companies where they basically parade out the fact that we've spent so much time making things better. We got a 30% increase efficiency in systems from automations. Woohoo! 
you know, VPs, they have to, you know, they have to hype themselves up in big enterprises. Well, you know what happens when that, when you do that? The first time something breaks, that gets blamed. Oh, I don't know what's going on there. It's, it's that automation. Um, the network doesn't touch that server. No. Right? So the, the second piece is the complexity of these things. By the time you realize you need automation, unless you just happen to start from the beginning, which never happens, right? Um, by the time you realize you need this, it's so complex you can't wrap your head around it. How do you do it? You get stuck in this analysis paralysis, right? What do I need to do? Well, chat ops becomes and creates a catalyst for your organization. It starts to help you think about how to start modeling things. And here's how you do it. Basically, you start to import simple tasks into your organization, into your chat rooms, right? Now, we have, a, we have several folks that we've seen this do uh, previous to me joining Stackstone. We have customers that do this. But basically, chat ops starts to allow you to start to model your communication structures and map them to actual tasks. Now, once you start doing this, watch people. Watch how they use things. What will end up happening is you'll actually learn how people consume the system as opposed to make assumptions, which usually what happens, right? I want people to communicate and interface with the system this way, right? Well, we've had customers, we've had community members that once they start putting in and creating chat ops, they realize that their user base uses the tools completely different than they ever expected. And that causes them to rework their underlying logic, start to abstract things, and ultimately break down all of this nasty business logic into nice, neat little primitives that they can then go use in other workflows. And why that's important is because now once you start to create these primitives of these workflows, you can test small atomic actions, you can test the logic, you can change things all over the place. And the abstraction's there that no one will know the difference. And this sounds a little bit familiar, right? Plan something, do it, check how it went, and then go do something again. Right? This is a classic PDCA cycle, right? PDCA cycle. So this is good. The second piece is collaboration. Chat ops and workflow really bring collaboration to the table. And so the question I like to ask is, as an infrastructure person, how do we collaborate today? The whole point of this conversation is to try to figure this out and to do it better. But the fact of the matter is, I know we don't do it well. Because every time I walk into a new organization, I rebuild the same stuff. Who else does that? Who has gone into a place and rebuilt the same stuff? Are you tired of it? Yeah, me too, right? We also take three to six months to onboard new employees. Why on earth is this acceptable? Right? Well, the problem is, is that usually we have these tools that are highly cut, uh, coupled to our business logic. Right? I need to connect system A to connect system B. Well, that's going to have, I don't know, something like proprietary information in it. It may have custom uh, business logic that can't be abstracted. And suddenly, now you have to do double blind studies to get infrastructure patterns out of companies. Because what happens is, your buddy goes to a conference, hears about this new pattern, comes back to your org, tells you about it, and then you go try to replicate it. We sure are making a lot of snowflakes. Well, workflows are interesting. Because I argue that workflows allow us to actually start creating true infrastructure patterns. When I talk to people about what I do in life, and I say, look, I'm an infrastructure architect, goes over their head. So I say, I'm a plumber, and they get that. But it's kind of a disingenuous analogy. Because there's no such thing as a, a pipe, like a literal pipe fitting for us. There's no elbow joint for, for infrastructure, right? We've all got our own snowflakes. We're all building in our own ways. And sure, we're talking about how to do it better, but I can't actually go run somebody else's infrastructure or the pieces of patterns that I know really well. I know there's a fantastic MySQL cluster at a company I left. Why can't I take that with me? I know that there's a fantastic uh, web server tier over here. Why can't I take that with me? Well, once you have workflow in the mix, and you can start to abstract the, word, the logic about how things are delivered versus how they get executed and the different actions, well, now we can actually start to share these patterns. Because I can give you the logic, and then you can choose what tools make sense for you. And I think that's the right way to do it. Because not everybody is going to be the same. It's OK to be unique. It's not OK that we don't figure out how to optimize within that. Right? So we get to start to share patterns here. And I also like to kind of naively think that at some point in the future, we may actually have a chat ops lexicon where I can go into an organization and say, I know how to use this system because I've talked to this bot before. 
And he knows the 10 different commands that I, you know, for MySQL or for Redis or Cassandra or whatever. Insert tool here, right? And so suddenly I can walk into a place, and that three to six month ramp up time, it's not there anymore. I'm gonna go download Mark Imbriaco's infrastructure, I'm gonna plug our tools that we have into here, and I'm gonna be rocking, and actually go do real things, not rebuild the same infrastructure again. Benefit number three, gain understanding about what's happening. So, you know, we're talking about infrastructure as code, and I really tried to put code on this deck, on this deck. Uh, part of me didn't because I wanted to keep it vendor neutral. The other part of me is it's hard to read code on slides. It's even harder to like talk to people about code. But once you actually start to have workflows behind you, you start to use visualization tools. And then things get really interesting there. Because you're able to use tools that start to like generate and create workflows for you in code. You're able to start doing differentials of visualizations, right? So the power there is immense that you can then start to actually share and and pass along infrastructure patterns to people and figure out what makes sense for you. Did I lose it? Okay. You know, when we're doing infrastructure refactoring, right, but on node scales or cluster scales, I'd like to do a data center refactor someday, right, and pull in somebody else's infrastructure. Once we have workflow really working for us, I think that these things will become more possible. And the other thing that the difference between, you know, implementing something like ChatOps does for understanding you embrace the communication structures of your company, right? For most of the time that I've been in IT, we've act actively forced users to behave with systems in a specific way. If they don't interface with the system, it doesn't work. Well, instead of saying, make your users operate one way, learn how your users operate. Embrace that communication structure. Because if I have chat ops, suddenly I have some mappable thing that I can dereference to some actual technology. And that's great. Because if I change how we talk about things in my organization, because we introduce new products or we have a reorg, I no longer have to be scared about these things because my code is not so tightly coupled to how we used to operate. We can start talking about things completely differently, and I can change the underlying backend. And likewise, we can change the underlying backend out and still talk about them in the same way. These are the power that chat ops and workflow together brings to you. Makes you highly adaptable to change. Okay, so gone through a lot in a very short amount of time. Maybe you're interested and you want to learn more. A couple of things you need to know. There's usually a bot involved, not necessary. Uh, Hubot is by far the most popular one. Uh, GitHub makes it, I'm sure you've heard of it. Uh, Lita is second popular, uh, Britain and Ruby. Ur is kind of a third, runs in Python. And then, you know, there's a little Stackstorm guy in the bottom. You know, I've never heard of commercially supported chat ops before. But there's also a ton of workflow engines, too. There's so many, and these are just a few. And they're coming out more and more every day. And some of them are in YAML. Some of them are in their own DSL, right? So the infrastructure's code paradigm is, is there. And you can take advantage of it. Now, I have a commitment to my wife that I put a cat in every single uh, presentation. So here, there it is. Uh, and it's kind of apologies for the last two slides being totally atrocious because uh, I couldn't make them look good. So let's quickly recap and I'll get off the stage here. There's three things you, that, that chat ops and workflow can bring to your organization. And when you go back, I want you to think about and go do some more research on. One, it's a clear path toward actual automation. The question marks that we've been exploring today can be answered using some of these techniques. It allows better collaboration between you and your peers and internally and externally using visualization tools, using uh, source control management tools, passing along true tested infrastructure. I would like that nothing more, nothing more than to be able to go download this infrastructure from somebody. And then understanding. And that's the true bit of it. I wanna know how my systems are operating, what they're doing, at what frequencies, so on and so forth. And that understanding only comes in small chunks at a time. Small chunks at a time. But guys, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Right? There's so much to talk about in the realm of chat ops and workflow. I couldn't fit it into here. But what I want to encourage you to do is I love talking about this stuff. Hit me up. You can find me, Jay Fryman, on the internet, james at stackstorm.com. Thanks. <laughs>